our talk tonight is going to be uh, fairly philosophical. I'm going to talk about a hierarchy of existence. It's, I'm going to raise the question, share some thoughts, but I'm not going to find a perfectly satisfactory answer. So this is going to be a somewhat of an open question. Let's begin. In this clip, Approaching Identity, I discussed how a human being can be regarded as having four parts, body, which is symbolized by the ox, emotion, the line, intellect, the eagle, and soul or consciousness or eye of spirit being an angel or a man. This is a Christian symbolism. We find the same four parts in Hindu uh, scriptures uh, too, but this is a uh, Christian symbolism. And we could say then that there are different planes of experience. Now here, by the way, at one point I called this consciousness and now I'm calling it the eye of the spirit. That's something that has to be reconciled in a future video. But given these parts of a human being, we have physical sensation, that's what the body experiences, emotions, thought, and uncreated light with the eye of the spirit. And these levels have been given names, a physical plane, astral plane, causal plane, and the ultimate plane. Now, of course, people can define astral plane and causal plane however they want, so this isn't perfectly standard terminology. In this clip, I did call, uh, talk about the eye, that, the eye of the spirit that gazes upon eternity, but as I said in other clips, I called that fourth part consciousness. So that's a point. But we have this division. And the idea is, is how do we account for, well, let's say thought. How do we account for thought in our system? We've pre previously introduced the idea of the mind scrape, where all thoughts live. But in our system, it's not so clear how we would account for that domain. Ultimate ground of existence, we've spoken about it often as being the ultimate ground of physical existence. But how would we count for the, the, the domain of mind? And one way to account for it is to split, stipulate dualism, to say, well, body and mind are distinct. Someone could even say, well, I will grant you the existence of the uh, ultimate ground of existence, but that's only the basis of the physical world, and he might maintain that the realm of thought is distinct. Uh, and that would be a kind of dualism. For us, we are embracing our theology as, as monistic. And I could have mentioned this much earlier in, in the clips I've made. I don't think I have. Monism is the idea that body and mind are manifestations of a single substance. And that's what our theology is. And here again, monism. So not that matter and mind are the same thing, or that God and the world are the same thing, but they're all single manifestations of one thing. And as we've said before, that we consider any gods or persons, if they exist, as creatures, just like we're creatures, just more powerful creatures. So, my point here is now to show that mathematics and logic does inhere in the world. To begin, physicists have wondered why mathematics describes the world so well. Here's a rather famous paper, and... The gist of it is that mathematics is unreasonably, inexplicably effective in describing the physical world. Galileo said that mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. Now, why should that be so? By the way, here are some physics equations that describe the, the, the universe. Newton's famous law is F equals MA. That's just a simple multiplication, although a derivative is involved there. But then we have Maxwell's equations and of electromagnetism. And these, these symbols, the meaning of these symbols, are taught in a Calc 3 course. But they're all pure creations of thought. Schrodinger's equation, the, the basis of quantum mechanics. Again, pure thought. These symbols have meanings. They, they, they're taught in uh, math courses and physics courses. Here's Einstein's general theory of relativity. This is actually, I believe, it's 16 equations kind of rolled into one. And here's a more, a more famous and simpler equation that Einstein wrote. But why should mathematics describe, well, how does it inhere in the world? Why does it describe the world so well? We don't know. Well, that's what I'm basically trying to explain. I'm trying to say that it does inhere in the world. 
and therefore it is compatible with a monist view of the world such as we have. This overstates it a bit, I'm sure, but it's kind of fun. And also, uh, there's a little example. I, I, as I mentioned before, I do teach math in a community college, and I just want to show how pure thought can rule the world in a way, de determine things in the world. So the idea is that here's a fact, and it's an interesting fact, I think. Take any positive number, like 10, multiply it by itself. 10 times 10 is 100. Divide by 3. 100 divided by 3 is 33 and a remainder of 1. Whatever number you pick, you will never get a remainder of 2. It's impossible. You could pick a 500-digit number that no one has ever thought of since the Big Bang. Multiply it by itself. Divide by 3. You will not get a remainder of 2. Here's a rather simple proof. It just You just need FOIL from high school. I'll go through it, but I won't dwell on it. Uh, some people might not want to see math. Anyway, well, there are three cases when you pick a number. Either the number is divisible by 3, or it has a remainder of 1, or it has a remainder of 2. If it's divisible by 3, when you multiply it by itself, like if, if the number is 3 times some other number, like, for instance, uh, 9 is 3 times 3, 18 is 3 times 6, 42 is 3 times 14. Well, if you multiply that number by itself, the 3 has become a 9, and then you, the p becomes a p squared. You can plot a 3. So this number is obviously divisible by 3, and you get a remainder of 0. You can go through the same kind of thing here. If you have a remainder of 1, when you square it and you do a little bit of algebra, you get this number. This number is divisible by 3 and has a remainder of 1. When you get a number that's divisible by 2, uh, I mean, has a remainder of two. I'm sorry, has a remainder of two. You square it, you do a little algebraic re rearranging, and you get a remainder of one. By the way, there's also another thing here. If uh, you had to bet on what the remainder was of some arbitrary number, well, you're twice as likely to get a remainder of one as zero, and you're never going to get a remainder of two. The point of all this is that this is just pure thought. People on another planet could have these thoughts. These are thoughts in the mindscape. Now, they wouldn't have the same symbolism, but they'd have the same conclusion. And just to dramatize the conclusion, here is 10 by 10. 10 times 10 is 100, so there's 100 asterisks here. Divide them into 3, and you have a remainder of 1. But the point is that would happen with any number. You'd have either a remainder of 0 or 1, never 2. So pure thought is telling you what's going to happen if you get a thousand marbles and, you know, well, or a hundred marbles or whatever. It's telling you something about the real world. The point of this all is that mathematics and logic in here in the world, they're part of the world, and therefore they're compatible with a monist view of the world. And uh, to answer these questions that, for us, somehow the foundation of logic and mathematics and other mental uh, phenomena would have to be the ultimate ground of existence. Uh, in a monist philosophy, it could be nothing else. I do want to mention that we've spoken about this kind of subject before in this clip. Emanations, just very briefly, we spoke about how one view of the universe is that the uncreated light is like the light on a movie projector, and because of the way it dances on the screen, it creates the physical universe. Well, that's all well and good, but we did not really address how the um, sphere of thought fits in with all of this. And uh, in a way, we, we, we did mention this, that ultimate ground of existence is the basis of matter, which is the basis of life, which is the basis of mind. And that's kind of tying in the, the mindscape with uh, our... Uh, one principle, but I'm going to try to do it another way here. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to refer to a book that uh, I read some time ago, and it's this one by Ken Wilber. And what he did was he took the writings of the world's physicists, that the writings that talked about philosophy and mysticism and a bunch of things, but he wrote a, a two-page uh, introduction at one point in the book, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So what I'm focusing on is what he wrote, he himself wrote. Well, also he quoted people. 
So we're here in the book on this page, and he says, Einstein said that nature is a realization of mathematical ideas. And then the author, Ken Wilbur, I believe, put in crystallization or precipitation. And uh, the idea is that this ties the mental realm in intimately if nature is a, is a manifestation of the mental realm. And uh, let's continue. But the physical realm is a materialization of thought has been uh, always had extremely wide support in the perennial philosophy, which we spoke about last time, the perennial philosophy. So and here he's saying matter is uh, the view that matter is a crystallization or a precipitation of mind. And by ontologically, not chronologically, he means right at this moment, matter is a precipitation of mind in some sense. And I know this is very uh, vague, but as I said, I'm not getting at a solid answer in this clip. But I do want to continue. And again, physicists have been profoundly struck by the fact that uh, the natural realm obeys the laws of mathematics. But if the natural realm is a, is a precipitate of the um, mindscape, especially of mathematical thought, then that shouldn't be surprising. It should be expected. He goes on to mention how some physicists have remarked on this fact in their own way and how it all becomes understandable if you consider the physical world as a precipitate of the mental world. And it doesn't, it means that not that matter is, is, is mind, pure and simple, but that whatever mind is, it's a condensed version of whatever idea or mind is. Whatever matter is, is a condensed version of whatever mind is. Again, somewhat vague, somewhat philosophical, but I did want to put these ideas out there. So, all, so he says here that because of this, all fundamental natural processes can essentially be represented mathematically. But he says the reverse isn't true. There's more mathematical schemes than uh, are needed to explain the physical world. The idea is that the mindscape is vastly larger than the physical world in some sense. And he says that this is the guiding principle the physicists use. That they find, uh, they, they have phenomena they look at various mathematical schemes that could uh, explain those phenomena, and then they choose the simplest and most elegant mathematical scheme that explains the phenomena. So in a sense, we started out with this, with body and then building up to the top, and that's kind of what we did here. We started out down here and then we went through matter and life. But essentially what uh, Wilbur is doing is putting this at the top. And seeing this as precipitate, uh, as somehow becoming less, or, uh, having less fullness. In other words, in this sphere, there is uh, more than in this sphere. And um, that is, I believe, a common idea in, in uh, philosophies that have the idea of emanations. So this leads to the guiding principle, he says, of physics. But in the interest of full disclosure, I do want to mention that there's a current physicist who, who sees this not as a good thing, but as a not, not so good thing. And here's her book. She's a, described as a contrarian physicist, and she believes that the search for mathematical beauty in physics has led, ethics, uh, led physics astray. Okay, that was a very uh, philosophical, uh, vague description of a problem that if, if you're a monist, and if you believe that the ultimate ground of existence is, in fact, the ground of everything that exists, then you do need to offer some account of how the mental realms and the emotional realms flow out of that. And we've just kind of uh, shared some ideas on that, but I, don't, I haven't answered the question fully. But thanks for your time.